Thank you all for coming tonight. Um, I'm Sue Kingman. For those of you who, most of you, I'm recognizing your names and, and know you and know your children um, at this point in time. So welcome and thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, we are have been thinking really long and hard about how to help our parents, you all, to feel connected to their child's experience this year. Um, it's a, certainly a much better year for us at give, having um, all of our children in school every day, but yet it's still not totally normal by any stretch of the imagination and we're not able to feel as connected to you all um, in our current health and safety practice to kind of have children in the building, but only have meetings with you all remotely at this time. So we have are very thankful and very appreciative that we have your kids here every single day. And we were trying to find ways to also find that connection with you all. So here we are. So one way to do this is to do some virtual sessions and this is what we're gonna give it a go and, and see whether I'm hopeful that this will be helpful. Our goals for tonight are to help you to all feel a little more in the know about your child's third grade experience thus far and what's planned for in the future. And we have a team of folks from Carol here with us tonight to really try to accomplish these goals. We have Glenn's Coleman, our assistant lower school division head here to share with you kind of from a big picture perspective, how your child's day is organized and where we focus from a real wide angle lens. We have our team leader, Caitlin Murphy in the third grade here to share with you a lot about the ethos of the third grade experience. We have Megan Shea here tonight, one of our counselors to share how we support, support children from a social emotional perspective. And we have our academic leadership team in language arts, Iram Hawk, math, Peter Morris, our focus area tutor tutorial, Portia Pierre-Mike, our speech and language pathologist, Jen Kurzrock, here as well to dig into more specific area of focus um, in their areas, um, specific areas of focus themselves. Um, and then we have a video from our multis team to share with you a little bit about what our, your children will be exposed to during their multi periods as well. So one takeaway that I'm really hopeful that you will get from attending this evening is that there are a lot of eyes on your children. These folks who, are, are, who you're going to be hearing from tonight are really very actively aware of how your child is doing both socially, emotionally, and academically in very discreet ways. So you know you all have homeroom teachers who you've now gotten to meet and have gotten to know a little bit more. Um, and they will always be your first point of contact with any questions, comments, or concerns. And they are supported by all of these people that you'll, you'll get to know tonight. Some of you may already know. Um, but um, in helping teachers to problem solve, um, to resourcing teachers, training teachers, and getting your children. So my big point here is that we have a large village of educators all with their eyes on your children. Um, and I wanna make sure that feels really transparent to you all um, as you hear about uh, the, the plans we have for third grade. So speaking of your kids, just big picture, I wanted to share that as a whole school, we have 160 children in the lower school this year. And in the third grade, we have 31 students. As a whole school, uh, we have families coming from over 95 towns. Um, we used to um, share that it was a 75 town base and now it's 95 um, towns. Um, so this is diversifying pretty significantly. And you know, speaking of diversity, in addition to our steadfast commitment to serving kids with LBLD, we really remain very committed to our work in diversity, equity, and inclusion. And in that effort, we have ongoing trainings and DEI-themed um, professional learning communities with our faculty. And we have dedicated DEI specialists now at every grade who are directly supporting this commitment. And this year, we have a theme called, uh, th called Perspective Taking. Um, where we really want uh, want to really dig in on every grade level and helping children to really have a sensitivity to various different backgrounds and perspectives. So what have we been up to um, in the month of September? And we've um, what we've mostly been up to in a very purposeful way is we've really gotten to know your kids and they've gotten to know us either as their new school or as their new grade. Um, and, and, and teachers in their new grade if they were with us last year or the years before. 
dedicated time has been set for setting up routines and with um, around grade and school cultures. We've been building connections, kids to kids, adults to kids. And we've done a lot of informal and formal assessments that are used as baselines and used in informing our instruction. So we're really start to ready to dig into the heart of the academic program. So all a very purposeful, intentionally slow start to build the foundation for social emotional readiness for learning. And we are now off to a great start and ready to go. And you may be hearing from your kids a range of things. You may be hearing it's really easy, I'm not really learning anything, or you may be recently hearing a shift in that position from their kids, like I love my new school, or third grade is really fun, and it might be shifting to, oh, I don't like it so much anymore. Or they may be showing you, showing you some old avoidant or worry behaviors they, that you were hopeful that coming to Carol or staying at Carol may have gone away but now they're back. So all these range of feelings are all expected um, to us as we introduce new expectations to your children very gradually, but may be less expected to you. So my overarching messaging is please reach out to us to be helpful as your child is adjusting to the new school year. Um, and don't hesitate to reach out to any of us at that point, you know, at any point. So let's get started. Um, we are recording this tonight so that uh, we were able to share it out to families who aren't able to join us this evening. Um, we do ask that when you have questions as information is being presented to please post your questions in the chat. Um, and we'll dedicate some time at the very end to be able to answer as many questions as we can. So let's get started. I'm going to pass to Caitlin Murphy, our third grade team leader and um, enjoy the evening. All right. Thank you. Um, so I'm Caitlin Murphy, and I'm going to kind of give you a big overview of what happens in third grade, um, what your kid's day is like, go over some of the routines that we've been working on, as well as talk a little bit about homework. Um, that'll be coming. Um, but first, I want to introduce you to our third grade team. So Iram, if you want to hit the next slide. Um, we are a team of four homeroom teachers, as you guys know. So Molly McKeever has been at Carroll now with us for five years and in third grade for four. Um, and a fun fact about Molly is that she is dyslexic and extremely crafty. <laughs> um, Maggie Mulcahy is there in the middle. And this is actually her 12th year at Carroll, same as me, um, but her eighth year in third grade. Um, and a fun fact about Maggie is she loves camping and being outdoors. And then Julia Shower on the end, this is her sixth year at Carroll, um, her third year in third grade. And a fun fact about Julia is that she loves to do pottery in her free time. Um, so that is our team that is spending our days with your kids. And so what I'm gonna do is kind of share a little bit about what we do in third grade. So Aaron, if you go to the next slide and one more time, so third grade culture is really important to us. Um, in third grade, we really spend a lot of time thinking about your kids in terms of their whole experience, their whole social emotional side, as well as the academic piece. We use responsive classroom in everything that we do um, from our morning meetings at the beginning of the day to our closing circles at the end of our days. Um, to really help focus on your child's social emotional well being, as well as their academic learning, especially after the year we've had. Um, and one of the ways we do that is by having a lot of traditions in third grade. Um, we really like to do project based learning in about every opportunity we have um, where we can integrate the academics and the social emotional um, learning. And so we also integrate the multis when we do our projects, we integrate all of the academic areas. And two of our major projects that you'll hear a lot about in the future, one is called Whaling Town and the other is Painting the Sky. Um, and so Whaling Town is where we learn about communities and how communities work together. And then what we do is we transform our classrooms into a colonial whaling village and the kids create basically a living museum. And it's quite an undertaking that where they learn a ton about how much they need each other um, to support them. And then also practicing those oral language 
presentation speaking skills as well. Um, so it's a really cool way to integrate everything that we do. And that comes towards the middle of the year. Um, and then painting the sky is our culmination of our writing curriculum where your child's going to watercolor paint four to six different times of day. And then using all of the tools we'll teach them throughout the year, create a descriptive paragraph about each time of day that we bind together in a book um, that they'll be able to share with you. It's really exciting. They can't believe it when they see it all kind of come together. Um, so those are two of our big projects, but we have a lot of other smaller traditions in third grade. One is that we use Harry Potter to really enhance our writing and comprehension curriculum um, in language. And then we also do pumpkin carving and a winter craft fair to reinforce math in daily life. Um, and then we also do a snack mix on Fridays where the kids are broken up into five, sometimes six smaller groups and outside for eating. Um, and they get to eat snack with a different group of kids where we want to work on some sort of social emotional skill with them, whether it be meeting new friends, whether it be building relationships that already exist or helping them with some sort of social skill that they're struggling with. Um, and we get to really use that time in a meaningful but fun way for our kids. Um, so that will be starting pretty soon. Um, and so you can ask your kids on Fridays about their snack mix group. Um, another piece of our day, Irma, if you want to hit one more time, is our community block. Um, and this is an amazing opportunity that we have on Mondays and Wednesdays where we get to work as a whole grade um, as well as work in five small groups. And what we're really focusing on is our diversity, equity, and inclusion. And really for third grade, thinking about our kids and their own identities, helping them to really understand who they are on the inside and on the outside, what makes them unique, and then thinking about that in a bigger scale with our community and thinking about that perspective taking that is our theme at Carol this year. Um, and being able to understand each other more, foster new relationships. And then the biggest piece for our kids is being able to feel vulnerable and able to take a chance in an academic area. So by understanding each other, understanding our community, they are better equipped when they get to their language class or their math class or their flex class because they feel more comfortable with the group that is around them. Um, so it's a really fun time. We use a lot of different picture books um, as well as a lot of different aspects of our language curriculum to build this understanding within each of the kids and then as a community on a larger scale. And then um, in terms of routines and executive functioning, your kids have probably been coming home a bunch talking about routines. We have been working on them a lot. Um, our overarching theory is that the more they learn the routines, the less they'll have to worry about remembering that piece and the more memory they'll have, more space in their memory they'll have to remember what we're teaching them. So a few of the, um, tools that you'll probably be hearing about and seeing one is our get ready, do done. That's those boxes that are red, green, and yellow. And the way that works is we plan backwards. So your kids are starting at done. What is it going to look like when it's done? Thinking about what do they need to do to get that done? And then going all the way to the beginning, what materials will they need? This will also come home as part of their homework. We will plan out their homework with them at school. And so our hope is that when they get home, they will look at their homework log know what materials they need, know what they should look like when they're completing that homework, and then be able to have that finished product. Um, so it's a tool that we use throughout our day and then also in the homework realm. The other piece that we use is shading the clock. So you'll see the clock is shaded there. And we put checkpoints for kids so that they can know how much time they have to complete a task as well as how much time is still left. Do they need to speed up what they're doing? Do they need to slow down? and really helping with them being able to understand time a little more concretely. 
um, as well as using visual checklists and visual routines. The kids have been working on their morning routine, their end of day routine, so that hopefully they come home with everything that they went to school with. Um, that hasn't always happened, but that is the goal. Um, and so that leads me into homework. So Irem, if you hit it again, we have started reading logs in all of the classes. So you should see those in the binders that your kids are bringing to and from school. They've been doing a great job. Right now, our goal is that they're reading for between 15 and 20 minutes a night, whether it be reading out loud, partner reading with someone at home or being read to um, or using Audible. Any of those are great options. As the year progresses, we'll start to send home um, books that they might have read in tutoring that they can then read out loud to you. But right now, you reading to them or them listening to Audible is great. Um, homework in general will start coming home in the next couple of weeks. We'll start with language only and then add in the math component. Um, you'll have language or math homework three to four nights a week, and it should never take more than 10 minutes for each subject. Our goal in third grade is truly that your kids take something from school, bring it home, do something with it, and then bring it back. Um, so some of the homework will seem really easy. Some of it will seem a little more challenging. Our hope is that they'll know exactly what to do and may need a little help with the reading of the directions, but be able to do things mostly independently. Um, as I said before, our real goal is that it's an executive functioning task of being able to take that binder to and from school. There is a pocket in the very front that is for parents. Um, we will put things in there that need to stay at home. So feel free to double check that pocket. Um, and then if you have anything to send in to us, you can put it in that pocket and we check those binders every day. Um, and then the last piece um, is that we do do a lot of outdoor learning and our multis are also outdoors a bunch. So this is my little plug. If you would like to send in a bag with some extra clothes, maybe some extra socks or an extra mask um, that we can leave at school, that would be amazing. Uh, just make sure that your child's name is in it. Um, but we will go outside. So whatever the weather is every day, please make sure they're wearing layers or raincoat, whatever. Um, and then in the winter, boots and snow pants um, because they will be outside. Right now, the only group that is um, in Bounders is, are, is the Mulcahy crew. Everyone else will start with Bounders in January. So these bags will be important then because it'll be quite chilly outside and Bounders is pretty much always outside. Um, so, and you'll get more details on that if your child is in Bounders. But if you wanna send in that extra bag, we would love it. Um, and then, like Sue said, feel free anytime to send your homeroom teacher an email. And if for some reason you haven't gotten, we've sent out three group emails. If you haven't gotten any of those from a third grade teacher, so Molly or myself right now, um, please send me an email and let me know um, so we can make sure we have the correct email on there. Um, and that is kind of our overview for third grade. And so now I would like to introduce you to one of our counselors, Megan Shea. Good evening, everyone. My name is Megan Shea. And as uh, Caitlin said, I'm one of the counselors at the Carroll School. Um, we thought it would be just good to uh, give you a little overview of what the counselor does at the Carroll School here, the lower school. Um, we sort of think of our job as helping building connections and community in the school, as well as supporting social health, um, emotional health and growth. And so some of the ways that we um, help with the building connection and community is, as Caitlin said, our whole school uses Responsive Classroom, which is a um, great uh, sort of overarching um, social emotional learning curriculum. And we um, start our days with that, and that's a core part of our of our of our structure of our day. Um, we also reinforce the Eric core values. Our Eric, you might hear the kids sing the Eric song or talk about Eric, and Eric is our um, core values of empathy, respect, inclusion, and kindness, um, which the kids hear about all day long. <laughs> um, we both teach community building classes and do some community building activities within the school. Um, one of which is our Helping Hands Community Service Club. The, the community service club um, helps, is, is made up of students of all grades. It's kind of a, a neat opportunity for kids to meet kids in other grades. 
Um, and we take on multiple service projects throughout the year. Um, the first would probably be coming up trick or treat for UNICEF, which we've done in the past. So if we can trick or treat, we will do trick or treat for UNICEF. We'll see what, what what's happening this year. Um, and then the kids. So the first couple ones we kind of help organize and then the kids really take off for the second half of the year and, and come up with different organizations that they want to support. And we help them to, to come up with a community service plan. Um, we also help with the today's hoorays. So today's hoorays is a, um, a like a, a whole school assembly you might think of it as that happens you know um roughly every other week and um sometimes we're showcasing different things that are happening in the grades and sometimes we have a talent show it's a big hit for the kids um they get to either record something they did outside of school or we record them in school and we get to share with the whole community um their talents and it is a big hit for the kids we have MCs who introduce the acts and the kids love to do that as well so we hope to um see the talents the the cool thing about the remote talent show was we got to see things that kids could do outside of school so we're hoping that some of that will continue this year um the other part of our job is really supporting the social emotional health and growth of kids and um so we do a lot of informal student check-ins um throughout the day um we are definitely a, a, a what's the word i want to come up with but an option for kids who are in a classroom and need to take a break or feeling kind of overwhelmed or just need another adult to give them a little space and take up space for the classroom. Maybe we walk to, to check out, we have a fish tank in the, in the front main entrance that the kids love to see or do a strategy, to kind of reset ourselves from if we're feeling too fidgety to get ourselves a little more settled or if we're feeling kind of low energy, helping teach the kids some tools that they can use to get themselves refocused um, and ready for the classroom. Um, so we done it, do it, a lot of that throughout the day. And some of that we do out on the playground as well. We'll be there sort of witnessing a lot of time spending out in the playground and seeing kids interaction and try to intervene at the moment and sort of teach those skills of how to, how to problem solve in the moment. Um, we work with parents as well. If you have any concerns, I encourage you to reach out. Maylee Perilla is primarily the third grade counselor. She happened to not be able to be here tonight, um, but myself as well between us, we, we, we cover the school. Um, so any concerns you have um, to reach out. So we work with parents. We also help parents who are working, if kids um, are seeing outside um, counselors or, or therapists, then we work with them to support um, using whatever language or tools they're learning in their therapy and make sure we can integrate those in the classroom as well. Um, and we have snack and lunch groups. We do a lot of, of um, snack and lunch groups um, to try to connect kids who maybe are friends and haven't quite um, made those connections outside. They're playing together, but they, they're trying to make those friendships stronger. Or if there's a, a, a lagging skill we see, then we help to get some kids together to get those, um, make those connections and help with skill development and strategy development. So you'll see Maylee and I at, at arrival, at drop, <laughs> dismissal. And so, you know, feel free if there's anything that's coming up and that you're having a question about, you can always catch us then. Um, or like I said, email, um, we're really happy to, to help support your kids in any way and, um, and work with the team to, to do that. So, um, nice to chat with you all tonight and I'm going to pass it on to, um, Glenn's Coleman, who is our assistant division head and director of curriculum. Thanks, Meg. Uh, welcome everybody. Thanks for joining us this evening. Um, Caitlin did a wonderful job of giving us some real specifics about third grade curriculum and all the exciting things that will happen during the year. My job tonight is to kind of give you a very broad overview of the academic program um, and join together with some of the department heads who we have here tonight to sort of, um, you know, help you understand what happens in throughout the day and uh, look at the child's schedule and see where, where things may fall. Um, so, Irma, if you could get to the next uh, slide. So um, I like to think about the academic program as having three major components. Um, there's a part of our day that we work on structured learning and remediation. Um, there's a part of our day where we really focus on building cognitive capacities and those executive functioning skills that Caitlin talked about earlier. And then we also embrace that dyslexic advantage where we foster children's strengths and um, really celebrate their individuality. Um, so Erin, if you can go to the next slide. 
I want to kind of show you in a typical third grade schedule where each of these fall. Um, so each of your children have this schedule in their binders. Um, the parts that are highlighted here are the ones that are specifically dedicated to that structured learning and remediation. And um, every child has a language class each day, a focus area class, nine out of 10 days, and I'll explain what happens on that um, extra day, a math class every day, and then we have what we call flex block, um, Monday through Thursday for a period. Uh, the flex block, just to kind of give you a, a, a general overview of it, um, in third grade, what we do is we spend the first couple of weeks doing some quick informal assessments with the kids and really determining um, what kind of additional support they could use to help them from both a cognitive realm and an academic realm. And then we make smaller groups, uh, groups of just about four, four or five, and the children are then assigned to um, a specialist. Sometimes it's a teacher, sometimes it's somebody who specializes in um, one domain such as the cognitive training versus RAVO. And, um, and we work in these small groups and we work on areas of challenges for the children. We will reassess the children mid-year and, and look at their profiles once again to see if the, the flex block needs have shifted. And if so, we will regroup. And then we will um, assess them again at the end of the year and kind of look at the progress over time. So you could really think of the flex block as an additional time where we really focus on that concept of GEC, give each child what he, she, they most need. Um, and so it's a time that we can really drill down and specifically work on uh, skills that your children need. Um, also within the structured learning and remediation period, um, our language classes and math are also very much geared to specifically towards the, skill, the skills needed of the group that they, the teachers have. And then of course our focus areas are the tutorials and Portia will talk a little bit about them um, later in this presentation. Uh, Iram, could you go to the next slide? So the second um, component of the program is uh, that we focus on building cognitive capacities and executive functioning skills of our, our students. Um, so we know uh, at Carroll that many of our students have some weaknesses in one or other or many areas of their cognitive development. So we really try to use and gear our instruction to facilitate work in that area. Um, so, you know, we, we, if we have a student who has a particular strength in a vision, in the visual domain, we may use that area to bolster weaknesses in the auditory domain. So it's, it's really to kind of look at the underpinnings or the foundations of children's brains and see how they work and to try to make them more efficient for learning. Um, we have specific periods of the day that we really focus on this. Um, even though it's embedded into all the instruction, advisory and NCLU, NCLU stands for No Child Left Unorganized. So they, they are the beginning and the end of our days where we really uh, work very directly to set kids up for success, check in, make sure that um, they have what they need, any questions that they have, uh, we can have answered. And then at the end of the day, you know, making sure they have, as Caitlin said, with the homework um, procedures, make sure that they're ready to and set up for success to go home and do what they need to do there. So those uh, beginning and end of the day are really the times of the day that we focus specifically on building these capacities. Um, and then, Aram, if you could go to the, la the next slide. Um, so then, of course, we know that uh, our students have many, many strengths. 
And we want to make sure that we are building those as well as remediating remediating other areas of weaknesses. So we spend a lot of time during the day, you can see here uh, the areas highlighted in orange, where we are just really celebrating kids and the things that all the great strengths that they bring to their learning. So that might happen in morning meeting at the beginning of the day. Or as Caitlin talked about, we have this community time where we can celebrate our students' individualities. And then, of course, we have a, a very robust, what we call multis program. You may have heard that referred to as specialists in other schools. They are the bounders and they are physical education and studio art and uh, music and community building and library. And um, all students have this at least twice in the course of their day. Um, I know there was a question earlier in the chat about why some kids don't have bounders. So we have we have a list of six um, six different multis, and each child is um, receives participates in three a semester. So what you don't have in semester one, you will have in semester two, and vice versa. So that's why some children are not in the bounders multi this semester. They will have it next. Um, going back to that Orton Gillingham nine out of the tutorial, nine out of 10 days, every other Friday, so you can look at that PM Friday and see that there's an extra block highlighted. The children are assigned into an enrichment category uh, where our multis are teaching some really cool things. Um, they're kind of, they've got kind of a club feeling to them. So the art teacher is focusing on a creative cardboard creations and the, the library teacher is working on puppets and books and so on and so forth. So it's an opportunity to also participate in some of these um, these these strengths, these areas of uh, um, creativity for students. Um, Aram, if you go to the next uh, slide, our multis, we have a wonderful group of, of multi teachers in our building and they went ahead and put together a quick little video just to introduce themselves. So I'm gonna have Aram start that right now so that you can, uh, you can meet the multis. Hello everybody, my name is Patrick Pate. I am the lower school music teacher here at Carroll. It's my 12th, 12th year, year doing, doing that. that. And mm -hmm. it's my first year as the lower school Maltese team leader. And for newer parents, Maltese is a word at Carroll that means specialist. You know, PE, arts, and all the other subjects outside of the core academic subjects. Um, in music class this year, the most exciting thing is we're back in the classroom. Last year, we were either meeting online or outside which is very challenging uh, for instruments like guitar and ukulele. So we're back in the music classroom, which means all the students get to experience the percussion instruments I have from all over the world. Those are great springboards into discussions about culture and identity. We um, also focus a lot on recorder in fourth grade and our instrument of the year in fifth grade is ukulele, but all students uh, experience movement, singing and instrument playing as part of the core curriculum in music. Um, I'm very excited to have all of you get to know a little bit about our other Maltese teachers. So let's continue this presentation. Thanks guys, look forward to being your kid's music teacher. Hi, my name is Miss Sifter. You will find me here in the art room. Um, here we are building skills for self-expression. We also are exercising our fine motor skills uh, with all sorts of different materials, uh, including clay. Every year people get a good healthy clay unit. Um, there are opportunities for problem solving every time kids step into the art room. We research for our projects. We do pre-planning, we do building, we do revising, we do rebuilding. Um, and it's a great opportunity. And those, those steps mimic writing, don't they? Wow. Also, we explore our world uh, through looking at art. 
And that helps us to begin to uh, develop an understanding for context of who we are and where we are in time and history and place on this world and how are the many ways that I could possibly decide to express myself. That's what we're here doing in art, and we're having a good time. Take care. Hey everybody, Coach Hendrick here uh, on our beautiful turf field. Really excited to have your kids again this year. Welcome to those that are uh, new to Carol. Welcome back to those returning. Really excited about playing outside, inside. We have more options this year. I wanna introduce Coach B to you. Coach. Hi everybody, uh, Coach B here. I'll be helping out Coach pretty much on our turf in our, uh, in our gym with PE. You'll also see me pretty much anywhere, anywhere else in the school. I might be with Mr. Payne one day, Miss Sifter the next, so. I look forward to seeing you and all the lessons we got planned. Hi, I'm Mr. Gregory. I teach Bounders here at the lower school. Uh, our Bounders program is based off of the Outward Bound program brought to us by a former teacher uh, back in the beginning at Carroll School. Bounders has been a staple and has been around almost as long as Orton Gillingham. Here, we bring out the confidence in your child. We find their strengths. We encourage them to go past their edges and to be a little uncomfortable. We challenge them to work in groups and to explore the natural world. In Founders, students can learn everything from camping skills that could involve setting up a tent, starting a fire, how to safely handle a knife, and create something usable with it. Students will also get the experience of taking a risk. It might be having other classmates keep them safe when they're off the ground riding a giant A-frame, or maybe spotting each other when they're up on a slack line. Students will also have the opportunity to have a little time by themselves, connecting with nature, and observing their own curiosities. Founders, I like to tell the students, is a break from the academics, but I teach them through play and they never see it coming. Hello, I'm Eric Jacobson and I teach makers. And I'm Jamie Fisher, also teaching makers. I am super excited to get to do some 3D design and some very cool 3D printing. I agree, Eric. And I think the thing that I'm probably most looking forward to this year is seeing kids really learn how to code using both Scratch and Spiros. It should be a really fun year. Hi, my name is Kelly Sampar, and I am primarily the fifth grade science teacher at the lower school. I also teach a fourth grade class, um, and I'm an OG tutor. Um, this year, I'm really pumped about partnering with Grassroots Wildlife Conservation to help head start um, some adorable but threatened um, Blandine's turtles. Um, so we work with them to gather growth data so the kids use food scales and calipers just like real scientists do to gather information and data about the growth rates of these little hatchlings that we spend the year um, feeding and taking care of so that when we return them to um, their homes at Concord's Great Meadows in the spring, they are bigger and stronger and they have a better chance at survival. So in fifth grade this year, pumped because these adorable little guys have a better chance because of our fifth graders. Um, so they're really helping our local ecosystem, which honestly, can't ask for anything better than that. So we're excited. Thank you. Bye. How's it going? My name is Kieran McCubrey. This is my seventh year at the Carroll School, but my first year working as a science teacher for the first through fourth grades. Uh, science has always been something that I've been super interested in. So I'm just excited to be teaching something that I'm really, really passionate about. Uh, I'm looking forward to this upcoming year.
Thanks, Aram. Uh, so hopefully you uh, heard their passion. They are a great group of people. Um, we're so fortunate to have them. They work very closely with students during today's hoorays. And as I mentioned before, they do enrichment and some of the after school programming. So, um, you know, I, I just really can't say enough about that, that team of multis. Um, so I have now given you a broad overview of the academic curriculum. I'm going to turn it over to Aram Huck, who is our lower school language department head. Thank you, Glenn, and good evening, everyone. It is a little hard juggle to shift from turtles to language instruction, but I'm going to try and give you, again, a very broad overview of the program in third grade. Uh, Caitlin already mentioned quite a few pieces, which is wonderful. So as language department head, one of my responsibilities is to place students in their language classes. And this placement is done on the basis of a real comprehensive and in-depth understanding of our students' neuro learning profile, as well as their academic skills. So we have four sections in third grade and the pace of instruction in each of these sections matches uh, the learners placed in those groupings. So on the slide that I have here, um, I would like to first kind of focus on the image of the brain because all learning um, happens with information getting, uh, you know, the input coming through the visual, auditory, or the tactile senses and the brain receives this input and processes it and organizes it and then you interpret and learning uh, happens. But at lower school, what we strongly believe in is that the effective and sustainable, le sustainable learning happens when the foundations are really strong. So brick by brick, uh, leaving no holes in place, like no holes, um, uh, behind, we try to really build this very strong foundation for our third graders in all of their discrete skills. The language program in third grade, if you were to ask me if I were to summarize that in one word, I would say systems. Because when if you look at all the components of the language program from oral language, which is a critical skill, not just for their communication, but also for being a precursor for written uh, expression. Um, we use a number of tactile tools for the working on the oral language and expressive language, but these are all systems that our students are learning. And I think we believe that once a student owns a system, really understands it and owns it, then they really carry them forward into the future grades and future learning. So for um, beyond tutorial in language classes, students work on their phonological awareness, their decoding and spelling as well. Uh, programs and interventions like Revo are used to work on reading with automaticity, vocabulary, engagement with language, and orthography, which is spelling. Um, deep comprehension systems, again, are also explicitly and directly taught in third grade, well before reading skills develop. And uh, students then use, um, you know, um, the puzzle chart that you saw earlier in the slides with Caitlin and really break apart a fiction story into different elements and also learn the reciprocal teaching or thinking strategies to how to talk about what's happening in the story. Uh, in a heavy, you know, in the world of today, as I think about how technology heavy our learning has become and as, you know, in our work, in our professions, how big a role technology plays. So I think handwriting instruction in many schools has kind of uh, gone off the grid. But at Carroll, uh, it's the opposite is the case because we believe strongly that handwriting is not only working on the mechanics of writing and working on remediating reversals, but at the same time, it is directly reinforcing phonological awareness, decoding, and spelling. So it is a very important piece of instruction, which is explicitly and directly taught in third grade using handwriting without tears curriculum, which is highly multisensory as well. 
Grammar in third grade is also taught on the basis of logic. Third graders are learning a system in which they are understanding conceptually what role each part of speech plays in composing a sentence. And so therefore those pieces, those abstract pieces have a logical sense to them. And again, this system will carry them forward well because they can grow that bare bone basic sentence by adding different parts of speech. So our goal for writing in third grade is A, we want our students to really have a very strong foundation in understanding concepts such as nouns, verbs, adjectives, um, prepositional phrases, so they can compose independently a grammatically correct sentence and they get a lot of practice. And some of the work that end of the year painting the sky that Caitlin was uh, talking about, that fun project, um, that is a culmination of a lot of this learning. So again, systems that they will learn for uh, writing sentences that are grammatically correct. Um, we have a lot of assessments, but before I talk about those, um, there is that executive function layer embedded in all of the instruction in language. And I think beyond it is in the entire day for the student basically, but having that backward designing on every project task or uh, assignment that they need to do really helps with them with their future thinking. Like what is my end goal and how do I work backwards towards getting ready to do it and then collecting all the material. So that is part of the fabric. That is the layer which is embedded throughout in all systems that they're learning. And uh, last thing that I will touch upon is that we have assessments for all of these domains, for oral language, for RAVO, for um, handwriting, grammar, you name it. We've got, you know, beginning of the year, middle of the year, end of the year assessments for all of them. And then there are incremental formative assessments as well, because they help us, they guide us in being diagnostic and prescriptive in our instruction and uh, progress monitoring, etc. We also do some standardized assessment for our third graders uh, for reading fluency, as well as for reading comprehension. Uh, three times a year, we do assess our students on a standardized measure so that we know how much gap there is that we need to close for them to be compared to other students in different part of the year, um, in the beginning of third grade, middle of third grade, and end of third grade. So those are definitely uh, a big part of our um, progress monitoring and keeping a track of our kids, you know, close, so to speak, closing the gap. So with that uh, broad overview, I am going to now hand it over to Jen Kurzrock, who is the speech and language pathologist at Carroll School. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Jen Kurzrock. I am the speech and language pathologist at the lower school, and I actually cover the entire lower school, so the first through fifth graders. Um, which is actually one of my favorite parts of my jobs because I, once I get to know my students, get to follow them through their entire career at the lower school. Um, I've gotten the chance to meet many of you already um, and the pleasure of getting to meet your children already, which has been wonderful. Um, I'm just gonna do a broad overview of how speech and language support works at Carroll at the lower school, um, but if you have, individual concerns about your students or things you'd like to problem solve or talk through, I'm always available um, as a resource to consult. So broadly, as um, Ira mentioned, there are a ton of supports and systems and programs that most of the non carol world considers a speech and language oral language program that are really embedded into our language curriculum because many of our students benefit from them. So where speech and language and my support comes in is for students who beyond our sort of typical language-based programming, could use some extra support, either communicating um, in the classroom, communicating with peers or with teachers, communicating on the playground, um, processing content, some of that social pragmatic piece, sort of where we need something addition, additional to access their school day is where I come in. And that can look one of two ways. Um, one is direct support. And with the direct support, that's when I'm actually with the student. Um, that's primarily typically for executive function support, expressive or receptive language support, or social pragmatic support. 
Um, and that can look a number of different ways. Most typically, it looks like push-in, where I actually go and join for their regularly scheduled academic programming. Um, and I'm there either because I've worked with the teacher ahead of time to sort of co-plan a lesson to target some kind of skill, um, or I'm just there helping to adapt the lesson that they were already receiving to make sure they're getting the most out of it. Um, sometimes I will also have an additional small group that I'll work with in a flex block um, because that group's needs have been identified as something that would be a good fit to work with me. Um, and sometimes I run a lunch or a snack group, if that makes sense as well. And then the other piece of my services is consultation based. So I'm always available to consult with parents. I'm always available to consult with teachers and um, tutors about things that are happening in tutorial to problem solve, to figure out how to approach something. And then a big part of my job is also for students who are receiving outside speech and language services, I consult regularly with their outside provider to make sure um, that we both know what each other is doing and that anything they're working on in outside services, we're making sure we're doing everything we can to generalize that to school so that they're actually using these lovely new skills that they're getting. Um, that is a very broad model, broad overview of the speech and language model. So as I mentioned, I've already spoken to a bunch of you. And if anyone has questions, um, I'm happy to speak further. But I'm going to pass it off to Portia Pierre-Mike, who is our um, department head for the tutoring department. Thank you, Jen. Good evening, everyone. My name is Portia Pierre-Mike. And again, I am the tutoring department head at the lower school. So tutorial. So the heart of an OG lesson is to provide diagnostic and prescriptive lessons. The goal is to have students ultimately understand the structure of the English language. The language knowledge through OG concepts taught in lessons begin to unfold the logic within the language. The beauty of a diagnostic and prescriptive lesson is that it meets each student, your child, directly on their path to a larger understanding. So instruction follows logical order of language, of English language patterns from simple to complex. So thinking about closed, syllable, closed syllables like not and building towards more complex syllables like neat, a vowel, a vowel team syllable. Concepts are taught systematically through multi-sensory approaches and reinforced until mastery. So mastery is the key and is the goal and creating stimulation through movement in lessons, seeing, hearing, and touching. So having a tactile experience as they go through their lesson and the concept they're being exposed to. Tutor and tutee relationships are rooted in trust. Confidence is built from success, experienced over time, and constructive feedback is normalized over the course of the year. These are huge aspects of tutoring. Assessments. So there are two formal assessments that occur in tutorial and they happen three times a year. The first assessment is our curriculum-based assessment, which is labeled as our CBAs. They are directly tied to the OG curriculum. Our second assessment is read naturally. And this is a nationally, na nationally normed reading fluency assessment. And in the coming weeks, you will meet your child's tutor at your second conference and receive more information in greater depth about your, about your child's experience thus far and your child's tutor's goals and also their personal goals that they have for themselves in tutorial. And now I would like, you, I would like to introduce the math department head, Peter Morris. Thank you. Thank you, Portia. Uh, hello and welcome to all. I am Peter Morris, in case you couldn't tell by that giant picture on the slide. This is my slide. Um, I'm the head of lower school math, and I'm going to give you a general overview of what math looks like in grade three. Uh, so at Carroll, our goal is to foster students' views of themselves as mathematicians and to provide opportunities for students to develop their math reasoning. Uh, in doing so, we place an emphasis on flexibility and deep thinking about problems, and we put that ahead of a focus on speed or memorization. So we start each year, and this has already begun in your child's third grade classrooms, uh, by defining what math is 
and what it means to be a mathematician. A common misperception that I think we all grew up with, and I know many of our kids have, is that uh, math is simply about getting right answers and getting them quickly. But doing math as mathematicians do involves visualization and exploration, creativity, and even play. So the most interesting and important problems in math involve making mistakes and then making connections um, by thinking deeply over longer periods of time. So I read a book to my third graders today, as, as uh, other teachers did, about um, a mathematician who spent several years working on the same math problem and puzzling through it. So those are the types of, of attributes we want to build in our math students. Um, some of the nuts and bolts of third grade. So in third grade, we formed six math classes from four homerooms. And uh, these two extra groups are taught by myself and by Haley Blacklow. Haley is the director of the graduate studies program that Carol coordinates with Lesley University. Um, having six math classes means smaller math classes. And this affords us the flexibility to give each child the level of challenge they need uh, within a group of learners who have varied math perspectives. As for homework, um, expect your child to begin getting math homework in the coming weeks. Um, that'll happen once language homework routines have been established. Uh, math homework will mostly be a review of previously covered content. Our goal on homework is not necessarily 100% completion. Um, rather, homework should provide an opportunity for about 10 to 15 minutes of practice in problem solving that your child should be able to complete independently. Um, if ever it's not the case, that your child uh, can do this independently or experiences struggles with math, with math homework at home um, that's beyond the level of being productive, and that will happen from time to time. Um, I just want to tell you up front to have them set it aside, send an email to the homeroom teacher and the math teacher just to make them aware of, of what your child is experiencing when trying to do their homework. Um, and that way we can, as teachers, address um, that in, in school, any misconceptions or um, issues with the homework. So you're also going to notice a lot of teacher modified or even teacher created recording sheets when you see your child's classwork or homework. Uh, we use the illustrated mathematics curriculum as our core curriculum and it, it has many elements that we do like, uh, but even the best math curriculum um, is made better for our students with certain modifications. And our teachers work very hard and are very skilled in taking resource materials and either modifying them or completely rebuilding them from scratch when, when necessary to make tasks more accessible and engaging for our students. Um, so that's just a little overview of what you can expect in math. I'm sure you'll have questions along the way and you can either send those through your child's homeroom teacher or directly to, to me. Um, so I'm gonna send it back to our division head, Sue Kingman, to, to wrap things up. Sue. Thanks, Peter, and thank you, everyone. Um, I'm hopeful that, as we stated our goal uh, at the beginning of our night tonight, is that you really got a flavor for what your child's third grade experience is going to be and about got a sense of all the different eyes and um, concentration that's being placed on each and every third grader's experience. I We do have a couple questions in the chat that I'll quickly answer um, and, um, and send you on your way to um, complete your evening. So one question came out about library and the opportunity to take books out of the library. And typically, absolutely yes, that's part of the experience. Children would have a library block as part of their multis rotation. Um, unfortunately, our librarian, Lori Lingham, um, had a bike accident um, right after the start of the school year and has had to have surgery and is going to be out for a little while. And so we have actually replaced the dedicated library block to give children more PE time at this point. Um, and that seemed like what we, the best, the most logical a way to approach using the resources we have. Um, and we do have opportunities certainly for classrooms to go to the library at any time and can take out books. Um, so all of that is all um, very much available to your children, but that's our current status with, with our librarian. Um, the other question, I, yeah. 
Please. Sorry, can I just add here? Yeah. So the other thing is that for the library, uh, one of the most ideal times for our students to go to the library is with their tutor. And they do that a lot. So one-on-one, -on -one, they would go to the library and really kind of go through books and uh, look at high interest and motivation, you know, that piece. So tutoring is a block where we do use that time sometimes to take them to the library. Thank you. Um, good point. And the library is very centralized in our in our building, as you all, um, some of you have spent some time in. And so therefore, it's a really naturally occurring sort of space to go for teachers to go with their children, as well as tutors to go with their children as well. Um, the other, another question was around third graders doing um, coding and having access to a makers class. Uh, we sort of teased you with a little bit of makers um, in the introduction to Maltese that you got an overview in that we do not have a dedicated uh, makers class in the third grade that does start in the fifth grade and then goes all the way through the middle school experience. However, our makers classroom space is available to all teachers at any time. So teachers will be taking kids down to the maker space to be able to do use all of um, the technology that's there to make learning come alive. So there's plenty of access. Teachers just have to sign up that space and Eric and Jamie are there to help to support. Um, and, um, and, and Caitlin, you want to talk about that a little bit? Sure. Um, we actually partner with the makers teachers and they have fifth graders make projects. Don't tell your third graders if they're listening, tell them to walk away. <laughs> they make a little project for the third graders. Um, and then that leads us to doing some of the 3D printing when we go to Whaling Town as part of our construction of each of our shops. So we get a little teaser um, in the, probably the springtime, winter springtime. Thanks, Caitlin, for that more specificity um, about how um, the makerspace is used. And then two more questions came in. One is around the OT component um, to handwriting and how that is supported. Yoram, you want to talk about that a little bit, about the Handwriting Without Tears program and how that is supported? Absolutely. Um, so Handwriting Without Tears itself is an extremely multi-sensory mode of instruction. I mean, students experience letter formation, number formation uh, in different modalities. So it's not just visual, it's also hands-on, tactile. They have lots of different ways like chalk boards and slate boards. And there's just a lot of reinforcement that is done through that. But we really will focus on lots of different aspects of handwriting from placement to sizing to orientation to um, you know, um, size, I think I mentioned that. So we, we do an assessment in the beginning of the year, we have direct instruction that goes on and then we reassess how students are doing. Reversals also can be um, remediated. In terms of support for fine motor, I think there are lots of uh, tools that we use that reduce the strain on fingers. So we don't have actual work to strengthen um, the fine, mo like the, the muscle tone or the fine motor, we work on the grip, but we don't have the OT component, which is the intervention of really improving the muscle tone. But at the same time, we can support the fatigue of fine motor. So if anybody has low muscle tone or struggles with, um, you know, handwriting or uh, fine motor, then there are a lot of things like slant boards to specialized paper to specialized pencils that we use, not just the ordinary pencil grips that you get. Uh, these are from the OT uh, kind of publisher places that we use that, that are really specific. Sometimes it's really customized to one student that might be using something totally different. So lots of support to make sure that it's not tiring for students who do struggle with it. Uh, but the instruction of letter formation, number formation, and it's consistent. The good news is that it's really very consistent between language class and tutorial. So they use the same paper, they use the same writing utens uh, tools. So I think there is that piece which is very important that it's all embracing uh, for handwriting. Thanks, Aram. And finally, the last question is just how much time on homework? It seemed like it might have been a question that came out right at, um, while Peter was um, presenting about math. Um, so Peter, you want to talk a little bit about sort of homework expectation as it relates to length of time? 
Yeah, so <clears throat> the homework guideline and Caitlin, um, let me know if I've got these times right, but generally like 10 to 15 minutes for math homework for third grade um, on the nights when it's assigned. And um, we really wanna hold kids to that time limit. We don't want kids working for longer than that in an effort to complete the homework. And so when I say we're not after 100% completion, we're really after just kids working independently for a specified length of time um, to get some practice as opposed to, you know, working for 20 or 30 minutes trying to, to complete the homework. That's not what this is about. Um, we want our kids to kind of get a little bit of practice and still feel energized and, you know, not like it was a slog doing their math homework every night. And Caitlin, you want to just answer like, do we alternate between language and math? Do we give both of the same night? How does that work? So we tend to give math homework and language homework about three nights of the week, sometimes four. Um, so they will have language and math homework on the same nights. And the same is true for the language homework as the math homework, 10 to 15 minutes, even if it's not completed, that's okay. That's actually information for us. We're trying to send them home with something that is practice, something that should be pretty independent. And if they can't complete it in about 10 minutes, unless we've put another note that's like, this is a three-day homework, um, then we want it to stop there so we can see what they can actually do on their own. Um, and as Peter said, too, when he was talking, email us. If it's taking more than 10 or 15 minutes to complete language or complete math, send us an email, stop the homework, put it back in the binder. There is no anything that happens if they don't finish it. That's not the point. Um, the goal is truly that practice and that repetition, as well as the executive functioning piece of it. Um, so roughly three to four times, and it'll be a total of about 30 minutes at the most. And, it, and if it is only 10 minutes that it takes, that can happen too. Mm -hmm. um, and that oftentimes worries parents. They think, oh my goodness, they're not being challenged enough in homework because they're getting it done so quickly or they're getting it done in the car, driving home from school and they're all done. And that's okay too. So we are not committed to looking at length of time kids are digging into homework. We're committed to making sure kids feel empowered that they're able to do their homework with independence. That is our goal. And so the work that, that's coming home does not reflect the instructional time that's happening in the classroom that is heavily supported. It reflects work we know they can do with some independence. So therefore they should be able to do it quickly and easily. So, so to Caitlin's point, let us know if it's challenging. It's not intended to be challenging. Um, it's intended to be empowering. I've got my homework done. I did it all by myself. I didn't have a meltdown at the kitchen table and I can go out and play. Uh, that is the, that's our goal. Um, so again, more questions about that, please ask. Um, and, um, and we're going to wrap it up and I really appreciate everybody's time tonight. Thank you for coming out. And again, we've recorded this. So if you want to see it again, um, when you're maybe have less distractions or the like, it will be posted in the Thursday update upcoming. And uh, thanks again. And uh, we'll see you again soon. Take care.